Our keynote speaker today is the Director of the School of Social Work at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. His talk today is on the global community of diaspora, contributions, challenges and prospects. Professor Nidana Mir. Good morning, everybody. Well, uh, I need to give a background of my diaspora background. I was born in undivided India, was raised in Pakistan, fought for a country's liberation called Bangladesh, and now in the United States for the last 31 years. Whenever I speak uh, in an occasion like this, I recall one of the famous stories of Albert Einstein and his sofa. Many of you might have heard it many, many times. Some of you might not have heard it, but I'll tell it anyway. You know, when Einstein got his Nobel Prize, he was giving lectures from college to college in the United Kingdom. And one day he was chauffeur driven to those meetings. The chauffeur said, Mr. Einstein, is that what you were so famous for? He said, yes, why? He was giving lecture on his theory of relativity. And he said, what you are saying in every meeting, I can tell from A to Z. I have memorized it after hearing you 26 times. He said, well, is that so? Well, let's do this. In the next college, they don't know me. So why don't you give the lecture and I will be your chauffeur? He said, Wes, it's very good. They Shofar took the podium, gave the lecture from A to Z, everything perfect, impeccable, fantastic. Everybody applauded and suddenly from the back, uh, a participant stood up and said, can I ask you a question? He said, of course you can. And he asked a very complicated mathematical, theoretical question, in fact, on his proofs of theory of relativity. And he looked at him and said, what do you do, sir? He said, I'm a professor of mathematics in King's College. He said, you are a professor of mathematics in King's College. You ask me such an easy question that even my chauffeur can answer. So chauffeur came in, answered, it was done. I'm uh, sorry to tell you, this is the first time I'm giving this speech, and I don't have a chauffeur. So please don't ask me easy questions. Thank you. Honorable Secretary of Ministry of Overseas Indian Affairs, Dr. A. Didar Singh, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Indira Gandhi National Open University, Professor B. N. Ras Sekharan Pillai, Ambassador J. C. Sharma, and Ambassador Paramjit Sahai, and Pro Vice Chancellor Dr. Lothar Pillai, Conference Coordinators Professor B. K. Patanayak, and Joint Coordinator Dr. Sadanandu Sahib. Conference session chairs. I have a number of them. Dr. S. Narang, Dr. Padman Sri A. Sunil Kothari, Professor R. K. Jain, Professor S. K. Nair, Professor Mark Boyle, Professor Margaret Wharton Roberts, Professor Francis Matambirofa, and Two, uh, the, both of the ambassadors are also session chairs, so I would like to recognize them twice. It's truly an honor and privilege to be the keynote speaker at this conference. I'm not only humbled, but I also feel exceptionally fortunate to get this opportunity to participate and learn from so many world renowned experts on the subject of diaspora and development prospects and implications for national. This conference is unique in more than one way. The presenters not only bring their rich knowledge and expertise to share, but also their wealth of personal experience as part of diaspora dispersed in different parts of the world. Many of the participants themselves have designed policies on development and diaspora opportunities and development. Many of them have actively participated and contributed to the economic, social, and cultural progress of their home and host countries. Ladies and gentlemen, what an honor to be in the company of such a learned group of individuals. Please join me in extending our heartfelt thanks to the conference organizers and coordinators for this, their thoughtful, painstaking, and arduous efforts 
to bring together experts, policymakers, and researchers from all over the world in one such international gathering in Delhi at the India, Indira Gandhi National Open University. I also highly admire the thoughtful planning of various sessions that extensively covered the breadth and depth of the theme of this conference. And let me now begin addressing some of the significant aspects of this theme and the associated sessions that have been planned to enlighten us over the next two days of this conference. As this session will examine the pros and cons of each issue, I'm confident that they will also generate substan substantive polemics and scintillating solutions to various perplexing problems. I'm going to skip, I had some definition uh, on diaspora, and I know that all of you, I don't want to preach to the choir, you all know that, but uh, after skipping that, I would like to move on, for the sake of time of course, to other issues that I would like to. Diaspora, diaspora in, in general do not have a single country of origin or a single country of destination. They are scattered throughout the world, they come from all directions and they, and they go to all directions. North to south, south to south, east to west, north to north and so on and so forth. There is no linearity in their movement. Even multilinearity does not encompass the nature of their dispersion. Uh, there could be also cyclical and spiral nature that could also be found. At times their mo movement was forced involuntary. At times it was volitional and voluntary. In peace time their voluntary movement was driven by pull and push factors of the post and home countries when they tended to move in the direction of economic, educational, business and scientific opportunities. Many of the groups also moved to gain freedom in democratic open societies from autocratic, fascist, repressive and close political systems. In the 60s and 70s, the movement of educated young and talented people from Asia and Africa to foreign countries, especially to the West, raised an alarming and human cry regarding phenomenon called brain drain. In 2005, Lala Ben Barka of the UN Economic Commission for Africa warned, quote, in 25 years, Africa will be empty of brains, unquote. While the trend has slowed down, the African continent still losing people who are urgently needed for its scientific, technological, social and economic progress. This phenomenon has occurred presumably in response to lack of opportunities at home. While the adverse effects of brain drain have been felt by many countries, there was no systematic effort to halt or reverse the trend. But in recent years, India and China, which have exported their best and brightest for a number of decades, have begun to set a reverse trend. Research has shown that effectively managing the diaspora has played a significant role in human capital and capacity development by generating efficient workforces, creating jobs, and raising incomes. To deal with financial, institutional, and societal, societal costs, challenges created by brain drain, Africa came up with some creative solutions such as virtual participation of its experts in national building without physical relocation. The session on diaspora and development dynamics issues, strategies and practices addresses this urgent and burning topic. The presenters representing Ireland, Switzerland, South Africa and Canada, chaired by Dr. R.K. Jain from India, will share their research findings and provide us with new insights in this regard, including issues related to management of diaspora, dealing with brain drain and engaging diaspora in home countries, social, economic, political and cultural development. Session 2 on human development also discusses similar issues including diaspora's role in nation building, advancing human development, trends in brain drain, brain, brain recirculation and circulation, reverse brain drain and so on. Presenters from Sri Lanka, Armenia, Macedonia, New Zealand and India will share their perspective on above issues. Any major discussion on diaspora, today either formal or informal, involves a discussion on financial and entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial capital. A significant aspect of this discussion pertains to the role of diasporas in economic development and poverty reduction. In this regard, remittances to the home country by individual wage earners has become the focus of much attention. In 2008, an estimated US dollar 328 billion were received by developing countries in remittances, of which India received the highest amount of all, about estimated 52 billion. Remittances consist of large international flow of money, such as development prospect group asserts it is 
more than double the size of foreign aid and definitely larger than the foreign direct investment. USAID Global Partnerships reported that of total resource flow to the developing world, more than 26% come from these remittances. While the remittances help improve the financial conditions and buying power of individual families, how this impacts the local community and national economy is not clear. In fact, in the absence of systematic mechanism for data collection, it is almost immeasurable for some developing countries. One recent agents encouraging trend, however, is that independent researchers and government agencies are undertaking systematic studies and documenting impact of remittances in terms of how remitted diaspora migrant resources are leveraged in other important ways for effective economic and social development. I'm sure that you will be hearing a number of presentations in this regard, and I would rather uh, move on and say that how many countries are represented in this conference to speak on the issue here. The learned researchers and policy scientists in the session are assembled from Indonesia, India, Southwest Cameroon, UK, Nigeria, and Bangladesh also Trinidad and Tobago and New Zealand to present their experiences and examples. I'm sure we'll gain immense insight from their thoughtful deliberations. History is replete with examples of how diaspora population groups are formed and are being formed due to their focused forced displacement through political repression and execution. Whether they want it or not, their fate and future in the host country is becoming intrinsically intertwined. With passing time, gaining stability and opportunity, they became stakeholders in the political system in those countries. Currently, we are increasingly witnessing active participation of diaspora groups in the nation building, in the host countries' elected offices like as governors, state and federal legislators, mayors, and so on. These politicians are actively sought by home countries' political powers to help build strong connections for advancing economic interests, trade, business, cultural, scientific, and educational cooperation. Recently, political and government lobbyists in, the, in India and the USA successfully helped sign the historical Obama Singh 21st Century Knowledge Initiative document by, signed by U.S. President Barack Obama and Indian Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. This will open up an unforeseen opportunities for every part of diaspora population to work in the area involving universities. And it's a, it's a really very, very, um, I would say, an opportunity I would say unbound and opportunities unlimited. So please be involved. I think um, Indira Gandhi National Open University can play a significant role in that endeavor too. Moving on, I would like to raise another critical issue in the life of diaspora populations, and that is the gender issue and women's empowerment. Being away from the home countries, root cultural practices relating to education, employment, marriage, childbearing, child rearing, women in the diaspora face almost quadruple jeopardy. They may be a student, a mother, wife, and employee. Managing all these responsibilities successfully is an arduous task that women face in diaspora communities, wherever they are. In almost all of the cases, there is a significant lack of home countries' support system abroad. The everyday chores they face are they have to study, cook, clean, do laundry, shop, drive, attend offices, take care of children, and attend, host, attend and host social events as well. As early as 2006, Rancho Nilsson Sita, in a paper presented in the annual meeting of the International Studies Association in San Diego, California. I know many of you have attended that International Studies Association conference. <laughs> raised a question about how the literature on gender and nationalism can help us to understand the gender dimensions of contemporary diasporic communities. While she documented observation and interviews from Prabhasi Bharati Yadibars in 2004 and 2006, I know Ambassador Jesse Sharma would be in attendance in this conference. I don't know whether Sita have interviewed her, him, but I think he will be able to reflect on that issue when we get an opportunity to have a nice dialogue with him. The question Sita raised was how the literature on gender and nationalism can help us to understand the gender dimensions of contemporary diasporic communities. While she documented all those from that interviews, she raised some focus and concerns like in what ways are women involved in the Indian government's efforts to reconnect with the diaspora? How are the ministry and other related organizations framing gender issues? 
and the ministry is exactly represented by Dr. Dida Singh here today. Uh, the Ministry of Moya, they really meant that. Uh, what are the gender images that dominate these efforts and what do these images reveal about idealized gender identities of the new diaspora? This question could be asked by any diaspora woman living in any host country, anywhere in the world, to the representative of their government who are responsible for connecting them back as resources to the home country. Valid, appropriate and burning questions indeed. These questions certainly transcend national boundaries and touch on global diaspora communities. Conference organizers also gave utmost importance to this issue and featured specific session on gender and diaspora. It will be chaired by Dr. Margaret Walton Roberts from Canada, where presenters from Taiwan, UK, Malaysia, India will examine <coughs> questions and prospects on role mobility and empowerment on immigrant women. Their network, social consciousness, and political engagement, as well as their role in managing home and home and properties in host country as a diaspora woman, including an examination of rationale for establishing a return and retirement fund for Indian overseas women. <clears throat> I'm positive that presentation in this session will spark lively discussion and raise many challenging questions regarding the role of women in diaspora. An issue of utmost significance of diaspora communities is their social, cultural, and national identity. In fact, it is for, the, for these reasons that sociologists, political scientists, and cultural anthropologists have been engrossed with the issues of acculturation, assimilation, and adaptation, and proposed many theories, models, and concepts. Generally, identity crisis is an integral part of discussions about diaspora. Mass media, especially transitional media, or diasporic media, have significant roles in process of identity construction of the diasporas in the global context. Representation of diaspora populations in country-specific local international media in films, theater, art, poetry, music, and paintings, literature, dances, and folklore are important vehicles to help preserve one's identity, force new identities, and help create new synthesized identity in the context of age-old traditions of the home country and new culture of the host country. While the experiences of every diaspora group is different and unique, Within the same country and the same diaspora group, individuals face different kinds of challenges of their identity formation, depending on their gender, age, educational levels. Very recently, Sanjana Satyan of Yale University, in her article on gender and nation in the South Asian diaspora, transitional cultural spaces in Bollywood cinema, made some revealing observations as follows. In the past three decades, Bollywood cinema has shifted from projecting anti-colonial understanding of moral and sexual female boundaries to emphasizing, emphasizing a more liberated diasporic female figure. In fact, he is, she is studied some very popular Hindi films. I myself have seen all of them. One is Pardes, Dulale Dulhaniya Le Jayenge, Kavi Khushi Kavi Gam, Salam Namaste, and Aachkal. I think many of you have seen that too. While Sanjana's critical examination reveals changing identity for Indian diaspora females, a number of featured presentations in this conference by noted Indian and Austrian film analysts and critics in a session in film by theater, films and theater chaired by Padmasri Dr. Sunil Kothari reflect other dimensions of diaspora identity and nationalism. Additionally, a session by, chaired by Professor Francis Matum Birofa of Zimbabwe on diaspora writings will bring home the historical significance of diaspora, this diasporic vision, nostalgia, and concern for homeland by a number of literary researchers from India and abroad. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, let me point out, even though we most optimistically share the positive ideas of diaspora engagement in home and host countries, their economic, social, political, scientific, educational, and cultural development, I must also draw your attention to some latent shortcomings and adverse effects of diaspora policies and engagement for their home countries. Dina INSQ of IOM Geneva documented some of the adverse effects that border on inequalities between those who have and those who don't have families abroad. Also, remittances as a source of income ostensibly may, not be, un may be unstable and create dependency on the part of recipients. Also, you know, Depicting diaspora as an ideal, migration as an ideal situation has also is, is, is a counterproductive kind of um, proposition. So we should be very, very cautious when we show 
diaspora as a model for other talented young people or talented people in every walks of life in their home country to attract them to a foreign country. Nevertheless, as Gina Ayanas pointed out, better integrated migrants in education, employment, housing, social networks, and communities can contribute more to their home countries than migrants with an uncertain status who are unemployed, underestimated, <coughs> and isolated in their host communities. For that matter, home countries can play a positive and assertive role to assist migrants in the latter category to help achieve legal status, gain employment, and help integrate into the mainstream society. And this is only possible if there is a strong bilateral agreement between countries catering to the best interest of both receiving and sending countries. This forum can play a significant role in to help achieve such objectives through active participation, research, and lobbying. Let me emphasize that it is a diaspora population that gave true meaning to the land of opportunity and the land of the free, especially to the United States of America, and added to the diversity of every country they settled in. They enriched the host countries by their cultural contributions in music, poetry, art, and literature. They made the host countries richer and richer by their contributions to science and technology, films and theater, medicine and engineering, politics and public administration, diplomacy and international relations, history and philosophy, liberal arts, trades and commerce, and among other things. Ladies and gentlemen, let's keep our spirit high and let's keep on doing what we are best at. Paraphrasing Marx, I would like to conclude this deliberation with the following message. Diasporans of the world unite. We have nothing to lose but a lot to gain by making our contributions to make the world better, safer, for peaceful coexistence for all of our, by the labor of our love, talents, passion, and productive contributions to all kinds of development, social, cultural, political, and economy. For the people of diaspora, For the people of diaspora, development should be the reduction of poverty, and poverty reduction should lead to the reduction of illiteracy, intolerance, and hostility, which in turn should usher in a new era of world peace and prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, let's strive for it commit to it, and prepare to dedicate our lives for it. Thank you, thank you all, and thank you very much.